With me today is a gentleman who's a legend in the game of snooker, the six times world champion Ray Reardon. Pleasure to have you on the show, Ray. Steve, thank you for inviting me along. It's a pleasure. It's nice to have a, a, a winner on, on the, the, the programme. Uh, well, I, at the moment, I'm not yeah, one. Well, no, no. But, but a champion. But not just that. A true, a I'm true, looking at the winner in any case. A true champion. And, and somebody who, who, who held that position uh, and, and was proud of it as well. I love snooker. It's, uh, it was a hobby. It was a pastime. But it was like food, really. No, I, in fact, if, if, I, if someone was to say, well, could you live without playing snooker? Oh, I couldn't. No. I've got to find time for snooker. I always found time for it. Well, as a young lad, I played all the sports. I was mediocre at ball games, generally speaking. I had sort of trials for the town in football, in rugby, in cricket, as one does when you're in school. But uh, I always found time to play snooker. It just fascinated me, and I studied it, and... And I studied the players who played it in those days, of course, going back to the great Joe Davis and Fred and so forth. And they were my idols, I suppose. But um, well, when you say a legend, I'm glad I'm, I'm, glad I'm a living legend. That's, that's very that's, nice. That's, that well, helps. You, you were my idol. People think I'm gone now. <laughs> You were my idol during the, the 70s. No, that's and, uh, very kind of you. Well, say, th yeah. there was nobody else to follow, with all due respect to, to, the, to Alex Higgins and jo John oh, Spencer. Oh, there were some good players. There were some, some good, players, good players, but yeah, in, yeah, you know, yeah. if you're looking around, you look at who's dominating the game, and you were certainly doing that. But you say you love the game, yes, but yeah. also, on the other side of the coin, something that you obviously get addicted to as well is the winning. Oh, yeah, you've got to be a winner. You love the winning oh, as well. Oh, yes. So yeah. you love, everybody loves the game, but how much of it is loving the winning or loving the game? Well, just it's, it's just like saying, you know, like, no, I'm no, I, I retired sort of ten years ago now, and um, I, I retired mainly. There were there were sort of a couple of reasons really. One of the key had gone, that was way back. That was, and then your eyes started to go, and you wore contact lenses, then you had glasses, the big ones like Dennis wears. But but uh, the main reason for retiring really was I couldn't win. <laughs> I only, only played to win. I didn't play to come second. I didn't want to know what you'd get for being quarter finalist or the last 16. No, I had to win it. And if I can't win it, bye bye, I'm away. And I went. So and of course, the, that started, you, you started that, didn't you? you? You're the one who put me on that trend. Well, I wouldn't yeah, say it's me. Which I'm very pleased to say because you came along at the back end of the uh, 70s. 70s. Then early 80s, you were having your major success, and but but yes, yeah, and, and I saw someone whom I thought I was when I was young, doing exactly the same thing, more dedicated than I was. I always thought you were a better tactician of the game. You you were better all round. You were more. You, you said I was sort of. Uh, what, what you say, that word killer instinct? Yeah. Oh, you, <laughs> well, my, you'd have taken some beating at that. Before we get onto your record. But that was wonderful. Before we get onto I love that, you see. Y you actually were considered, um, in many ways, a very strange player it, um, by, perhaps by modern day player. They couldn't, you couldn't do it now, but, but then what you'd do, and I used to watch a load of snooker, I used to watch all the players, and, and what you'd do, apart from having um, uh, to, to be more in command around the table and look like you were in control of the situation, yes. it always seemed, right, that anybody that's of my era, it would always seem like Ray Reardon, let them get off to a nice start. They pot, yeah, you could pot a few balls. Um, get, you can have 50 points in front if you want. That's right. Let yeah. them go, yeah, it's okay. But then with two or three reds left, they wouldn't sniff another ball. But that's the idea of the game, isn't it, surely? Well, it is, but it's, it seemed, it, it seemed like <laughs> it was planned. Way of it, seemed, it couldn't have been planned. to it, probably, yeah. No, it, it wasn't planned, no. It, it was just that uh, I, I always thought, well, if there's enough balls on the table, then, then we level. Doesn't matter whether he was 66 in front with five reds on the table. He's got no advantage over me, no. If I get the five reds, I'll take five back from him, and I'll pip him on the ball. You watch snooker now? Yes. Any Not as much as I used to no. do. It. Do you think it's a difference in the game? Same game? Or is there, some, is there something else in the game now you have to have? We, we'd have to go back to when you started, really. And then after that, when Henry came along. And then you get your others coming along, like O'Sullivan. And you get all the great ones in between Jimmy's and, Jimmy's and so forth, and Alex's and what have you. Now. But uh, 
and your Terry's and so I go on, I could go on with you, leave somebody out, and it wouldn't be fair. They're all great players. When it, it, I would, I would say my judgment of how things have gone from from your era, I, I can't go back any further than that, but from the era of the 70s, yes, yeah. was that um, a mistake didn't cost you so much, but also you didn't have to take so much of a risk because you would get chances. Not you, but the players would get yes, chances. Yes, that's right. Yeah. I now feel when I play, and I've been playing for four decades myself, yeah, all strange, yeah. Yeah. that now I'm in a situation where I feel I have to go for more balls than I like because if I don't, somebody else is going to pop one and, 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 and it's in. How do you feel? Oh, if, you were playing to, if you were playing today... Do you think we should be talking about that? No, 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 it's just quite... This no. is a very good question, no. that is. If we you were playing today, day talking about if that. You were, if you were playing yeah. today against the likes of Stephen Hendry and Mark Williams, yeah, yeah. knowing full well what they can score, yeah. would you, as Ray Reardon, think, well, I've got to get in first, otherwise I'm never going to get in? No. Right. No. So you'd let them hang themselves even so? I, when, um, it, it went in my era, when the one who came along, besides Alex, was, was Jimmy White. Well, I thought was a better potter than Alex. But I thought Alex was a, a be better defensive player than Jimmy in any case. Most shrewd. Uh, clever player, as Mr. Higgins, yeah. Um, and then Jimmy came along, and Jimmy would pot him from anywhere, you know. And I, I always say people can pot them anyway, and they still can. But if you come into that bottom cush all the time, and you leave a positional or a pot on which puts them in trouble if they miss it, they may make them in the early part of a match. But when it gets to the back end of a match and they come under pressure, they're not going to make it. And the secret is that when they miss it, yes, then you've got to pot all the balls. Yes, of course. Yes, so you are right in one aspect. But I, I wouldn't, uh, I'd only attack him if I thought I could win the game by doing so. I, I wouldn't take the risk of, say, well, I pot this and I'm going to go into and un hope to get on the black or the pink. Or, no, well, I wouldn't do that. That's the same as my era. That's the way, I, that's that's the right. way we had I to think then. That. But it seems, it seems but strange. But you changed, I remember. What do you feel? It. Yes. Well, it all changes. But of course, when you first started, who did you have to learn from? When you first turned professional, yeah, that, that's that's a good question. Who yeah. did you have to learn from? Who uh, was around at the time? Well, how did you? Could I go back further? Than yes, that? go on. Yes. Uh, the reason for that will answer the question really. Um, at the age of sixteen, um, I had an, I was involved. I got invited to play an exhibition against the then amateur champion of Wales. Talking about 1948, by the way. I mean, you weren't born then. No. And um, it was a guy called A.J. Ford of Abertillery. And I'd just come back from the final of the Youth Championship of Great Britain and the All-West final with Jack Carney at Pontedowie. And I got back home, got this invite to play this amateur champion, you see, the then. And, uh, oh, I was really looking forward to The best of seven frame, the exhibition, Wiley uh, Workingmen's Institute, just, just above Blackwood. And uh, my dad and I, I think your dad goes around me, my dad yeah. goes around me. And we caught the bus down to Blackwood and we walked to Wiley because we didn't have any transport, you know. And we went to this little mine where we, and there was AJ Ford, shook hands at the law. And we played and, and after the first game I knew that I was going to get whacked. Right. Absolutely annihilate. <laughs> and I loved it because I saw a style of play I'd never seen before. It was a stun screw game around the black area, the short game. Right. And he was lethal at it. Now, I'd never seen it, other than a little glimpse of Fred Davis occasionally, John Pullman, or even Rex Williams when he was going around doing exhibitions. And the reason, for that, the reason for that is the white ball doesn't move any distance to go wrong. Uh, that's right. It, complete control of it, you see. And this Ford was, well, he was the, the, I'm the chairman. And I'm going back on the bus, and I lost 4 nothing. Uh, and my dad says to me, and he said in his Welsh voice, he said, well, good boy, good God, boy. He said, what happened, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, Dad, didn't, didn't, didn't you see it? I said, different class. I said, you know, he played a different type of game. Than I said, I've never seen that game. But I said, I know how to do it. Yeah. I said, once I see it, like, you, like your good self, if you saw something, you say, I, I like that, I love that. Yeah. And I went back home, and I never played anybody for, for two months. And I just played around the black, this stunned screw and mastered it, you know, yeah. Six months later, I'd entered the Welsh Amateur Championship, and I played him in the final and beat him. 
Right. And I, I then retained that Welsh Championship for six years, and I played him four times out of the six times in the final. At the time, uh, winning the Welsh Championship wouldn't have, even if it was on your mind, wouldn't have, uh, you wouldn't have been able to qualify for being a professional. Is that right? Uh, but to win the English Amateur, which was the, nation the whole of the British Isles, that was the one that could ter make you turn yeah, professional? Turning professional, uh, I, I never had any aspirations or ambitions to be a professional It wasn't player. really like that? Well, there's no money in the game. I, I mean, when you won the English Amateur Championship, it was sponsored by Joe Corral, the bookmaker. And, and uh, you, you won it, and you got a voucher for £30. Oh, wonderful which um, I remember going down to Austin Reeds in Oxford Street and I bought a tie with it. <laughs> That's a nice and tie that, then. And that was in 64. Right. 30 pounds, one tie. And the pros, there wasn't a professional circuit as much? No, no. They, they, I, I mean, the pro, they, it, it didn't lay in the doldrums, hadn't it, really? It, it, uh, I John think the Paul? last time it was played for about 1966, something like that, or 1965 perhaps. So you'd reached the pinnacle of what you thought was really available yes, to you, yes. which was winning the English and winning the, and uh, dominating that is the it, Welsh. That's it. I, I had no ambition to be a pro. That was it. So, uh, so then but I got invited to go to South Africa with uh, Jonathan Barron, the then World Amateur Championship, because the World Amateur Championship started in '63, uh, and eventually he won that because Gary Owen won the first one, uh, and then Barron. That was amazing. Jonathan Barron, Mevagissi in Cornwall little fishing village of some 10,000 people no more, produces a, an English and world amateur champion. It takes him down. Because he had no opposition, no, no class to play against. I mean, where we played in Wales and like London and, and the north of England, there was a dearth of great players. The amateur game was rife and strong and powerful. But, but suddenly, I knew I got invited to go to South Africa. 1967 it was. And we won this test series against that country, and we can, on, on the way coming back, we'd got back to the airport at Jan Smuts Airport, and uh, there's a guy called Ken Shaw of Union Billiards, uh, who's the MD of that company and out there. And he said, look, he said, I like your style of play. He said, you need a few things knocking off the corners. But he <laughs> said, if you decide to turn pro, you know, he said, give us a ring. He said, and I'll be back out here in six weeks. All right. I was then in the police force. I'd come out of the mines, uh, got buried in the mines. Uh, buried in the mines? Joined, yeah, joined, buried for three and a half hours down in Florence Colliery in Stoke and Trent. Really? What? Uh, uh, Coal faced. Oh. Yeah, in the roof fall. So there's one of my lives gone, you know. That's like <laughs> it I played thousands of games of marbles in my mind with my brother. Because I was buried and I couldn't move a finger, couldn't open your eye, couldn't open your mouth. I had to breathe through you, 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 and through your nose, and all the dust goes up your nose. I just, oh, it's terrible. And your blood pressure's building up. So I had to concentrate and played marbles. And I think it stood me in good stead for snooker, really, because nothing could be worse than that. I don't think anybody can yeah, really you know, associate with something like that. Nothing could be worse than that. And then one about, well, it's not, that's only a game. It's like playing golf, it's only a game. And it's wonderful. But don't you come under pressure, though? Wow! But you, you had to make the decision then. Yes. So from after, after obviously, I would imagine, uh, not to, to know your life story, that once you got buried, you got out there and became a policeman. That's then I applied to join. <laughs> right. So then uh, that's right. But and then eighteen months later, I became a policeman. Decent wage. PC one eight four Raiden. Hmm? Plod. Plod Raiden. You call me Plod Summer. No, I heard that. Somebody told me about that. No, that wasn't me. That was somebody else called you Plod. I just a, a gentleman we both know called uh, uh, Paul Smith called you well, Plod. Yeah. Was wonderful. And so great nickname. Do. Why not? Why not? So you and John Spencer were the the two up and coming upstarts that have infiltrated the the old brigade. Even. Yes, and then Gary Owen, right. and then David Taylor. David yeah, Taylor, Silver yeah. Fox as well. That's right, and then came along sort of um, Graham Miles and Dennis Taylor. I wouldn't say they were exactly in that order, but it was a, roughly that order, yeah. With so few players, uh, in a way, you were very much in to, to generating your own tournaments, in a way. Would that, you were responsible. Oh, How would it go? It was very difficult to, in those days. No manager. No, well, no, and there were, there were no managers in the game then. No. Well, there's no money in the game for anyone in any case. So how was it kick-started? 
by the, mainly John Spencer turning professional first of all and then I joined and then so did uh, Gary Owen and David Taylor and we went to a meeting of the, the then WPBSA Limited and we were more or less turned down they said well you can't join you know there's no money in it there's no room for to join to join to be a professional mm. <laughs> so who was saying no well, we won't go into that. Oh, okay, right, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> Other players? The then establishment. The players older than you. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. And, and um, Spencer was sitting that side of the table. Owen was over there. I always remember, and I'm sat here. And, and the Silver Fox, as we know him now, was here. You know. And it was flabbergasted, you know. It got turned down, you know. Turned down from what? You know, there, there isn't any world championship. We're not going to take any living away from these people because there isn't, the, there isn't anything. So I look at John and say, and he goes, mm, well, I guess, and I look at Gary and he goes, mm, and I said, oh, right, okay. So uh, I just stood up and said, well, thank you very much, John. It's very kind of you to invite us along here. He said, it's cost me about um, 20 pounds to come here today. When you could have told us by post that you're not going to accept us, why did you bother bringing us here? Because we didn't have any money. I mean, I'd left the police force. Uh, so seven years, eight months I'd been in there. So I had superannuation, which came to about £364.6 and six and eight months. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and I've just lost £20. We're coming down here, you know, and got turned down. So we said, well, the best thing we can do then, I said, John, uh, uh, Gary, David, I said, we'll, we'll form our own association. I think that's the best idea. And we won't invite them into ours. We would go on. You know, who cares? You know, there's nothing going to There's nothing happening anyway. So we were going to go out, and then suddenly said, Well, just a minute. We, we've reconsidered. You can join. Uh, right. right. <laughs> just like that. <laughs> OK. Yes, I can. So then um, the first. So then we said, Right, we, we, we want to get the World Championship going again. How many players? Um, eight. Eight? Yes. Eight. So uh, we said, Right, well, uh, what we'll do then, we'll, we'll all put in a, an entrance fee and we'll play for it, winner take all. Right. <laughs> and whoever's drawn out first, depending on how many people we have, will arrange it in their hometown. And if they can't do it, it'll be passed over to the other part. Like if you and I were playing, yeah, yeah. and you came out first, you tried down, down in your part, and if you couldn't do it, you said, Ray, I'm, I'm, I'm having no luck here. I said, thank you, Steve, I'll have a look here, and say I didn't have any luck there. Then we'd pass it back to the association to arrange a venue. And, and we would have a percentage of the, the, the gates. Yeah. To, to make sure we were in something, you see. <laughs> a hundred pound entrance fee. Ooh. That's a third of my, my kitty. And who won it? John Spencer. Did everybody put their hundred pound in? Eight of us put our hundred right. pounds in. And John Spencer won it. He beat Gary Owing in the final. Where did you come? I lost to Fred Davis. I lost 25-24 to Fred Davis. 25-24? In the Tunstall British Legion Club in Stoke and Trent. So you had home advantage? Brilliant. I'd never played in I'd never played in Dunstall. Was this a semi-final? No, for, uh, for uh, first quarter round. Quarter final. Quarter final. Right. That's the first no, round, not the quarter final. Steve, first it round. Was brilliant. I'm playing the master. Yes. I, oh, I, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to be drawn against anybody else. It's, this is my idol. And I lost twenty-five, twenty-four. I learned so much about tactics. And the following year, I drew him again, and I played him again. But that time, I had my revenge the next time. And that also was in Stoke and Trent. That, that was not in the Tunster one, that was in another, in another Middleport British Legion. But the same, the same policy of uh, put your own money in? Or yes, it changed but, by but the difference of money there was, instead of it being £100, and you've got to bear in mind that none of the establishment were in, were in the final, it, it, they now made it £20. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was funny, really. <laughs> so you were, which you, is more realistic, anyhow. Yeah, you know. So two things for you then that were massive was uh, yes. I'm not too sure of the order now, the time order, uh, Pot Black and the Embassy World Championship. Well, you see, yes, Pot Black came '69, 
Yes, which, which I won the first one. But of course he didn't go out until the, the May-June of 70. And of course in 70 I became world champion. So it all happened overnight? So I had, I had the double whammy, if you like, yeah, of winning the, well, your ambition, if you like, my ambition then, yeah, to, to win that. And then sort of a month, two months later, they're showing Pop Black and I won it. Which was the most important to the television viewers? Oh, Pop Black. Pop Black, more important than the World Championship? Yeah, because they didn't see the World Championship on television. No. They only saw a little snippet of it, you know, yeah. On grandstand or something like that at the yeah, time? Yes, about an half an hour or something, you say, yeah. Highlights or something, you know. So you're playing 25-24, uh, you, uh, the, the, what, was the, what was the final of the World Championship? You won, you, you beat? Uh, 75. Some best of 75 38, frames. 35 against John Pullman. You beat John Pullman 38, Here 35. in London, here in London, yes. Must have taken five days? The week. Two sessions a day. Two sessions a day. Slogging your guts out That's on the right. table. Yeah. Nobody saw it. One frame, pop black. Everybody's watching. Instant success. Brilliant, isn't it? Well, it's just ridiculous. Well, he brought it to, to London. <laughs> it's, it, it's, there's, a, there's a there's a hall opposite um, off Southampton Row, opposite uh, the Bloomsbury Hotel. Round the back of there, there's Bloomsbury Hall. It's got to be Bloomsbury Hotel. Bloomsbury Halls. And I've won it in there. It's it packed. Must be a thousand people in there, all stayed up. Who saw me win it? Young Alex Higgins. Really? He's come up to me and I've just won. I've just, I've just, I'm elated, I'm delighted. I've achieved my life's ambition now that I've turned for to be world professional champion. That's what it's all about. And he says to me, he says, I'm playing you next Tuesday. <laughs> and I thought, <laughs> I, I don't know where I'm I don't know. I don't how, know old was, how old was he? We're talking. He'd about. be 18. Right. I, I don't know whether I was playing him or not. But he <laughs> says so. And there was a guy with him who had a little thing under his arm, which we'd call a file of facts of today. But it was a little book then. And his what was his name? Broderick. That's right. Broderick was his manager. He had a manager. Ooh. First manager on the scene. Right. And um, I'm going to be playing him in Oswald Twistle, up on the northwest coast, mining town. So, all right, so Tuesday comes along, and now I've heard about Alex. I've not seen him play. I've heard how exciting he is, how prolific, how he does things in a different way. And I'm looking forward to this very much, you know. Yeah, I really am, yeah. You see, so many new coming in the game. This is, I mean, I, I was, I'm still getting old, though, you see. I mean, when I won my world title, you see, I'm 38, 37, 38. Right, of course. I mean, he's a young lad, 18, you know. Oh, I can really associate with it because he's got the ambition that I had when I was young about playing snooker. And it's, it's wonderful. So anyhow, we've got to Oswald to sort of mining town. I'm a miner. You've got support. I've, You've got oh, plenty of support there. I've got there. tons of support. <laughs> so, so the game's going along. And he's playing shots I've never seen before. And he's doing things with the whites. It's, it's whizzing all over the place. There's, there's, there's side on it, there's deep screw, it's, it's sizzling around the place. You know? And I said, well, there's a much shorter way of getting there than that, you know. Because <laughs> you know, you know, we do in our own way. And, and suddenly he's gone onto the table and he scored 68, I think it was, 67, 68. And there was one red left. And I can't win. And he's broke down on this last red. You see? And a voice came out of the audience. And he said, 68 in one minute, 32 seconds. <laughs> now, no one had ever said anything about time. Putting time to yeah. how long it takes to pot balls. Now, no, I thought that was ace, you know. I mean, you need things, don't you? It's all show business at the end of the day. And I thought, yes, yes. It's got to be this guy, Broderick. Can't be anybody else. And he didn't, and he certainly didn't have a stopwatch. He's just picked a number out of the sky. And me being what I am, I go to the table and I pot the red, you see, and I said, one red, one second. <laughs> Beat that, you know. <laughs>Which of those six world titles, obviously considering yeah. that the first one's probably the hardest, which one gave you the most pleasure? I would have thought uh, 75 in Australia. 
that was held in Australia. Yes, when... Um, was it a one-off in Australia? <coughs> Excuse me. I, I reckon there was a possible eight world titles in me. All right. Mm. And I reckon I should have won seven. But we won't go into that. We'll, go, well, we'll, we'll talk about that later. We'll have a chat about that after. Because <laughs> we don't know about that. I don't know, talk to you about that. But uh, um, I know Australia, you played Eddie Charles. Australia, in, in, in fact, it, uh, 61 frames. Eddie Charlton was your your big rival, not your biggest rival. No, no. But he, I mean, John Spencer, Alex Higgins, Dennis Taylor. But Eddie Charlton always thought he should be world champion. Yes, uh, he must hate me, but he doesn't really. <laughs> he probably doesn't like me. That's all. <laughs> Can't hate anybody. So I've done anything to. <laughs> Was it, was it the case, now this is my, once again, you know, sort of selective memory coming in, was it the case that Eddie Charlton uh, orchestrated the World Championship to be held in Australia to give himself the best possible chance of beating the likes of John Spencer and yourself to win the World Championships? I wouldn't, yes. You wouldn't, wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, say that, go that far, but... I wouldn't exactly say that, but I wouldn't go against it either. I would say <laughs> that there'd be a good 40% truth, I would say. <laughs> yeah. So all of a sudden, you've all had to traipse off to Australia. Well, uh, what it was, you see, I mean, <laughs> steady Eddie, eh? <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we've got to go, well, I played a lot in Australia. Um, yes, I, I played a lot in Australia, I played a lot of big tournaments in Australia. Yeah. I toured with Eddie in Australia, I toured New Zealand with Eddie. Uh, I've been there 12 times, so I, I was indebted to him in many ways, I suppose. But when I played him in the 75, he was uh, 29, 23 up, best of 61. Best of 61, yes. 29, 23. First to 31, you say. First yeah. to 31, 29, 23. And I've won seven on the trot and gone 30, 29 up. Seven on the spin. Aye. And he collapsed. Yes. How can I see? Only people like yourself will know this. In front of a packed Australian crowd. Henry will know it. World champion, great players will know it. There are times when you go to the table, irrespective of what the score is, irrespective of what the tournament is, that you hit your peak and you have a buzz. Something happens to you. You become oblivious of anything or anything. They could drop a, a firecracker at the side of you, you wouldn't hear it. You, 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 people could wave to you in front of you as you're playing. Wouldn't make any difference. You would be focused and you'd be really keyed up you know and, and excited your heart with the move you, you, you'd be trembling from here down but you'd be in total control of the cue ball you know he's yours isn't he really and you, you talk to him and you, and you put him exactly where you want and that's what happened Eddie's tearing his I, hair out well he did tear his hair out didn't he really? <laughs> literally <laughs> in the end <laughs> but so I got to 30 and then he won the 60th he relaxed a bit. You, you eased off the pedal? I've got to tell you how it happened then. Can I tell you how yeah. it happened? Yeah. Can I tell you this, actually? It's his break off. This is the last frame? Last frame. Right. Now, you, you say about... Nerves are jangling. No, but you say about tables, no? How, how we could favour a table to have to suit him to give him a better chance of winning. Didn't guarantee you winning, but we could have. The table that suited Eddie? Yes. Sort of a dead ball cushion, for instance. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, how can you get him in trouble? He can hit his eyes you like. He can book the ankle. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyhow, he's done the. What we're saying, hold on, we're saying that if he plays a loose safety shot, Doesn't matter. then it flies back up the table. Once it hits that bottom cushion, it's not coming back up the table for you. If he came up a foot, you'd be lucky. <laughs> Right, so they had a dead boom, bolt cushion. Boom, <laughs> cool. And probably took all the bolts out of it or something. <laughs> and he's done the perfect break off. Traditional, back, green cushion down the bolt cushion. Right in line with the green, tight on the bolt cushion, on a Brunswick table. And it's difficult to get your hand because the, on a Brunswick table, instead of it being flat and then the, the cloth coming level, as a cushion and then under the table. It, it slopes like that and, and you put your hand on it that way. And you, 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 it's, it's funny, you know. Yeah. Anyhow, I can't stay up the table. 
I can't pot a ball and I can't come back a and I can't stay up the table because there's a ball come out behind the black on the back round I can't leave up and there's a thinning off in the corner pocket number one pocket so thin you've got to hardly hit it and I make it you know you play a deliberate foul no it just went in oh, I said, oh, fair enough. Yeah. It, was, it was probably the best shot I've ever played in my life. <laughs> <laughs> it was, and we had a Nana, Nana Wadding basketball The only stadium. way to get back down the table. Nana Wadding basketball study of Melbourne. 4,000 people in those days. <laughs> 3,996 Australians. <laughs> and, three, and a couple of others. <laughs> I didn't have many fans in this <laughs> audience. You know. But I, as you say, I don't mind. That's, that's fine. I'd rather play in front of his audience than play in front of mine. Because your own expects you a lot, don't they, really? Whatever that is. Gone enough. Foul, gone fall away. And, they, and all the crowd went, oh. <laughs> and of course, when I went, I went, I went, I got, you know. I go, wow, what a shot. <laughs> what a luck. <laughs> it's only, wow, what a shot. <laughs> and as I looked at the table, there's nothing on. There's nothing on. So Eddie's sitting over there, he rushes into the table, <laughs> as you could imagine. <laughs> and he looks at me. And I'm looking somewhere up there, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and is that anyone knows him? And, and it, so he plays a safety shot down behind the yellow, right tight on the ball because you're in line with the yellow, and he's opened the balls up. And I still can't come back. I still can't put a ball, and I can't stay up. And they play another thin enough on this side. Another shot, enough. Impossible. The only thing you could so do. So thin, unbelievable. And straight in the pocket. And the crowd went, wow. And I go, <laughs> and, I go and now I'm looking over there. And Eddie's run to the table. And, and, he's, and I'm over here because there's one red on. It's a straight dig into number one pocket. And he's got to stop the ball dead. And the pink goes in the opposite black pocket, number two. But he hasn't got an easy leave. If he misses it, he loses. But if he gets it, he wins. What's he going to do? Does he take it and on? And I'm thinking... He's never won it, has he? Uh, can, uh, can he do it? Can he...? <laughs> what happened? And Tell me, because I've forgotten. Said, All right. Play again. Hey, what? He put me in. He play again. Really? Yeah. Right. Because the other rule, you know, that's the rule, isn't yes, it? Yes, of course, play again. Yeah, I forgot oh. that, yeah. So Eddie, now, instead of sitting down, he's gone and stood at the side of his chair. Always sat down. This time, and I walk to the table to see, and I look at it, I can see what the situation is, you see. And I look at him, and I smile, and I say, hi, Eddie. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Zap. Straight in, this bump. He's the best straight ball player in the business. Yes. Because he never put any spin on the ball. He was right down the middle, he was accurate. And he wouldn't take it off. And he lost. And as the red went in, he fell over into <laughs> the chair. <laughs> and he was lying on the floor. So I put my cue on the table and I went to him and helped him up. Oh, yeah. And put him, yeah. I put him in his chair and said, Are you all right? Because I thought he'd hurt himself, you see. Yeah. And I say, you okay? Uh, yeah, he said, I'm all right. So I put him in the seat. <laughs> well, I said, have a drink of water, have a drink of water. And then I went back to the table, put a bit of chalk in my keel. Let's have a look at this now. And then made a empty of it, whatever it is, and then we shook hands. Now. That's incredible. <laughs> oh, that's, a, that's amazing. That one, that one, that was something. Of all, of all the players that, that um, have ever played the game of snooker, um, and obviously you can't judge this because y y you are you, um, there's never been a player who's intimidated the opposition more. Now, that's a fantastic attribute to have. Was it? That's not quite true, really. It was true How in no one's know? Ended. I, I was saying. Because you had it. You no, no, you oh, intimidated yes, you no, you oh, no, intimidated yes, you me. No, I didn't. You did. I'm oh, telling no. you. I'm gonna tell you you did. I, yes. I know what you're gonna say. But wasn't well, it wasn't true that wasn't 
No, but I tell you, but from the moment you walked into the <laughs> into the snooker room with a cue in your hand, yes, you'd be the master of the room, the master yes, of the table. Yeah, okay. agree, agree. Is this something that was in in very important, though, isn't it? It is, yes. But it's, is it something you came naturally to? Did you did you decide I, it, it worked wasn't, or what? I, do, I didn't know I was doing it. No. No, no, it wasn't uh, premeditated or deliberate. No, no. Do you think that's changed snooker? I mean, there was a time when Ray Reardon was untouchable to play. You'd get one chance in a million to play him, and you'd be so nervous. Or Steve Davis, uh, yes. whatever, right? But now, there's so many tournaments now that the players play each other oh, so times often. Have, oh, times have changed now, you know, yes. But, but you had it in your, when you started, you see, yeah, when you became along. Uh, you, you turned pro, what, 76, 78? Yeah, 78, yeah. Was it 78, really? I know, somewhere on there, and you get but along the way, all of a sudden, you get that you get that feeling and I of remember superiority. Playing, I remember playing you down at Romford when Barry used to bring us all. Good manager, Barry. <laughs> very astute man. Very, very good. Great for the game, also, by the way. Did lots of things for our game. Elevated everybody's earnings as well. Oh, yeah. But he brought all the players down to play you. And that was really something, really. Because that, that's something you can't buy, isn't it, Barry? It's experience, you <laughs> know. I don't know anywhere where sells it, you know. It's all gone and it's all sold out, you know. It's wonderful. And of course, when you did come along, you had a few struggles, you know, you had a few little hiccups, as we all do in, in the beginning, like I, when I started. But you soon put it right. And when you did put it right, you found what you were looking for, that authority. And when you went to the table, you, this is my table, I'm in charge. You know, and you. Proceeded to, I would imagine, proceeded to do it. As I said at the start, very good. At the start of the show, I love that. You, you, you were, you were love my it. hero watching. I watched many times Shit. you play. I think it probably rubs off. You do follow. But I love that, you know. Yeah. Of course, I to remember going through a period of time when so many players were tapping the side of the queue uh, on oh, the yeah, table because yeah, they were yeah. Alex Higgins fans. Yes, isn't that amazing? And all of that. I mean, that's good. That's, that's not good. But the players, it really. brings me around to perhaps the sorry subject and something you mentioned earlier on about the seventh world title that you thought was yours. I, I it's not the one you think it is. Is it no. not? Is no. it not the it's not final 82. in eighty-two? It's not eighty-two. No. Do you not feel that I'll eighty-two you was yours? Yeah, yes, I did when I got back fifteen all. Yes, you actually um, had Alex Higgins as your uh, opponent in the final. Yes, yeah. And, and we, all, yeah. we know that he's a good, good safety player. Yeah. So w w was not not the fear of. I'd like to see those last couple of frames. To see where, where, where it all went wrong. No, I know where it went wrong. I, I I played a safety shot and I nicked the green and went in off. Then I, that that cost the game. Then the next game I, I did the opposite. I nicked the brown and went in off in the other pocket. Right. I, and he, he did. The, and then the last game he made hundred and something. Yes. Yeah, yes, but it wasn't that, that one. There was the other two. Uh, the two nicks, a nick and a green, nick and a brown, on a defensive shot, and they, they both finished up in the pocket. Which would have been a marvellous achievement, because how many people, and th th I don't think there are, there's only one person in the modern day game that I can think of, has won the, the World Championship in, in different decades. That is Alex Higgins. Yes, yes. He would have right. been rightfully, I think, uh, Seven times world champion. Yes, but I'll, I'll tell you another one about that. Another one. Come on, tell us about his eighth no, one. What? No, you're not no, going to. You're not no, going no, to, are you? No, no I know no, you're not. I, no. I can, it's, <laughs> it's a secret. It's a secret. Yeah, we'll remain. But I will tell you. <laughs> so, uh, getting up to speed now. Um, as you say, you retired from the game when? Uh, officially, I would say '91, but I, I stopped '89 roughly. Fell out of love with the fact that it was getting. You were getting bashed over the head by every player coming through in the I, game I, or not? More a case of not wanting to go through the rigmarole of the qualifiers? There was a few things really. The, the, I got over the queue business because I found another queue eventually, you know. I, I already had it, anyhow. And, but my, I had a problem with my eyes, you know. I you used to wear had, a, sh a card deal, a I, shade. I had, I had always a problem with my eyes, oh, honestly. Um, it, it could be something to do with in the minds, where you give a little bit of a, like a stigmatism of some sort. I don't know. I'm not making an excuse because I won my world titles with it. I yeah. guess it can't be that bad. But as it as you grow older, it, it deteriorated a little bit, and I, and you'd see me sitting down. I'd be rubbing my eyes, and my eyes would be pink. You know, air condition used to do it, and then I got contact lenses, and, and I went to the guy who invented contact lenses. I found out who that was. And he came down to New Bond Street here where he, he's, he's, he's got his consultancy. And he fixed me up with these things and th th they went well for about three or four years. And then my left eye rejected. So we were looking at 72, 73 then. 
on my left eye rejected and I had to go into glasses oh glasses wow no good if you can't see they're wonderful but uh, <laughs> from, from <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the thing about it is, you see, that <laughs> well, with contact lenses, they're like your eyes. You've you, you got this peripheral vision. Yep. You can see, you can relate to the corner pocket and a cut ball up alongside, you know. With glasses, you can't see that. You can't see the corner pocket and the ball and the cue ball and cut that ball in there. When you're cutting the ball in, you can't see the pocket. Right. You can't relate. Oh, that's difficult. Right. Yes. Oh, you can't relate, no, honestly. You've got to be playing a few years to adapt to that. Great achievement for Dennis Taylor to win. Oh, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So you tried, what, how many different types of glasses? Did you <coughs> different lens types and things like I that? I had a few, had a few different, but I, I got good glasses. And, and they're excellent. I'm not blaming the glasses. It's just coming off your own eyes into contact lenses, growing older, going heart. into glasses. And, and you're talking about something like five to seven years, you see. Yes. Well, you put seven years on your, on your age when, when you're in your sort of early 50s. And you, you can't do it. And of course, all the young people are coming into the game. The system has changed. You've got to pre-qualify. And I couldn't pre-qualify. Oh, n what, in the bowling alley? I, I call it a bowling alley, I did. With all the multi-table setup, 20 tables at Blackpool. Well, you had these lanes, weren't they, really? <laughs> and of course, I, I think they got it a little bit better now, in, in so much that um, the players sit this side, the audience side, whereas before you used to sit that side looking out to the audience. So every shot was played towards the, the, the people? Yeah, whereas now you, you're back, you can sit down and your back's towards the audience. That's nicer. And you're aiming at the, at the, the back wall. But of course, for somebody like yourself, who, I can't from, do it. you were no a bit of a, a showman as well. That's right, there's no one to talk to. There's nobody about it. There was no atmosphere. I, I couldn't get motivated. And it wasn't me. And I thought, no, I'm going. I, I didn't want to hang on and, and finish all the way down the ladders and go, no. I, I, I got I to win. If I can't win, I want to go. So, what was your last game? I it, went. Where was the last? What was, was your last, last match? match? I don't know. Ninety-one. That would be nineteen ninety-one. My news. Who was it against? You if know, they it was keep against. going the way they're going, you know. If you have all this this breakaway group and all that, if I reckon if the top sixty-four go, I think I start again. Get back in there. Ah. Can you not remember who your last fancy, match was against? Fancy, fancy winning it. Eh? <laughs> as, as long as you go as well, as long as you, as long as you move over. There. <laughs> <laughs> was it a sad day when you retired? No. Or do you, you give you, No, you, I, I let go. Yeah. Yes. Oh, no, honestly, no. I, how could I be sad? I, I, I owed so much to this game. I got a passion for this game, and I still have a love snooker. I have a few odd people who still come and see me and say, show me how to do this, that, in, in the game. You know? And they say, what do I owe? I say, you don't owe me nothing. I said, just give me a ring. If I'm around and I'm able to help you, I'll do it. Don't anything. You just come down if I can help you. Marvellous. Well, oh, it's wonderful. It's been a pleasure talking. We go on talking about oh, it. Oh, But it's God, been an absolute yeah. pleasure. But I'm s look here, I've got to tell you this, you know, because I'm not doing anything now. But I'm so busy, I haven't got time to do anything. <laughs> That's always the way. How do you work out? I know. I can't get through the first <laughs> round of a tournament, and I'm busier than I used to be. You're busy, but you're a poor man. Bit of pool you're as not well. a poor, you're a snooker player, <laughs> right? But I still like to see you in it. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank uh, you for uh, some me great answer. stories in the past, and uh, good luck. We with haven't all. started, have we? No, we haven't really. No, mm -hmm. but every time you pick your queue up, I know you'll enjoy yourself. That's right. It's been a pleasure. Thank I'll you. Be a, don't forget the golf course, Cheerston Golf Club. I'm uh, coming. Thanks very much. I'm up for it again next year, by the way. Great. So if you're down, I'll extend the uh, courtesy of the course to you. Marvelous. Thank you very much. <laughs>